Live from Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Emilio Madrigal, and I am remotely joined by my colleague, Rifat Manan. Today, we are excited to kick off a three-part ENT PATH series with none other than Dr. Lester Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a world-renowned head and neck pathologist who has authored multiple books and many chapters in the WHO Head and Neck and Endocrine Organs Blue Books. Dr. Thompson is also the co-editor-in-chief of the Head and Neck Pathology Journal. I want to quickly mention Dr. Thompson's uh, website, which is lesterthompsonmd.com, that I think is a treasure trove for pathologists where you can find valuable information, journal articles, modules, and techniques that cover different aspects of daily practice in anatomic pathology. Again, that website is lesterthompsonmd.com. Today, Dr. Thompson will present his talk titled, Who's WHO? Who's New in Sinonasal Tract Pathology? As always, you're more than welcome to ask questions by typing them as comments right here in the Facebook Live and YouTube watch pages. And we will make sure to pass those questions along to Dr. Thompson at the end of the session. So with that, I will now turn the microphone over to Dr. Thompson. Well, good morning. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure for me to be uh, here this morning, although I know it's afternoon, evening, and probably super early in the morning, wherever else other people may be listening in. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this, and I think it's an awesome opportunity with PathCast to be able to have a virtual library and digital library of pathology-related topics, and so I'm really enthusiastic to be here this morning and be able to talk about some of them. So what I'd like to do is go over some of the new entities that were covered in the uh, World Health Organization classification of head and neck tumors. As you know, this book came out um, earlier uh, last year in 2017 and uh, certainly did encompass quite a few new things. I do think it's kind of fun to always put things a little bit in context so that we understand uh, where we've come from versus where we are now. And so I'm putting up a picture from the World Health Organization meeting in July of 2003. And you'll notice these are the members of the writing committee. Those are the ones who attend the meeting um, in Lyon and sit around and come up with the actual verbiage and terminology. And so, you know, I'll point myself out here, right? I'm the one giving the lecture, so why not? But um, what I'd like to do is just transition this slide very slowly into 2016 when we had our meeting. Of course, it was in January, very dreary and snowing, which is why we're inside. But I'm just highlighting that, in fact, I did not move. As you can see, I'm still in exactly the same position. So this is just to highlight that while there are several new things um, in the WHO books, there are also several things that did not change at all. And so I'm going to highlight um, what we did with the book. So today, I'm just going to do uh, entities within the sinonasal tract and paranasal sinuses. Actually, it incorporates some of the skull base as well, since, as you know, many of these lesions can expand up into the nooks and crannies of those areas. And so one of the major changes in this particular book is that the inclusion criteria for an entity to be covered within each of the various chapters was that the tumor occurred exclusively at that site or was involved in other head and neck sites but had a predilection, and in this case specifically for the sinonasal tract, or was some tumor entity that was very important in the differential diagnostic consideration. And so when you think about it, um, salivary gland neoplasms, bone and cartilage tumors, and the hematolymphoid lesions um, certainly do occur in the sinonasal tract, but in fact may occur also in multiple other areas and so they were only covered once in each of the uh, chapters of the book. And so lest you think that this is some august body of people, it is not. We're all sitting around a desk discussing the various entities and the terminology and the references that we are going to incorporate and so forth. So it really is a very cordial and collegial environment where everyone sits around and discusses this. This happens to be the one that was discussing the sinonasal tract, ear and temporal bone and larynx as a, a three-part section that we were in charge of at that particular meeting. So when you think about what the entities are in the new World Health Organization book, I'm going to highlight the following that are being discussed in a little bit more detail as um, entities that were incorporated for the first time. So if you think about the 2005 edition, there were 76 different diagnoses covered in the uh, sinonasal tract and paranasal sinuses. Lo and behold, in 2017, it went down to 39. So isn't this awesome? That means you actually have less things to uh, discuss and think about. Even though there are new entities with the exclusion of repetition in the book, you can see that we really were able to cull down several of the entities and get it down to 39. 
So let's start off with non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. So when you think about this particular lesion, it really is not um, necessarily unique or specific in the sinonasal tract, but certainly is one of the more common uh, sinonasal tract squamous cell carcinomas, accounting for about 20% um, of the tumors in this location. Sometimes people will use the term of transitional carcinoma or cylindrical cell carcinoma, but um, it is definitely um, a term that non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma is a little bit more encompassing. You'll notice it occurs in the older decades um, of life and men more frequently than women. From a pathology perspective, it's usually this very uh, smooth stromal interface. It has kind of a pushing border of infiltration rather than individual cells. And then it has this very um, immature appearance to it, showing very minimal to absent keratinization. Although the cells tend to have a very high nucleotidoplasmic ratio, sometimes nuclear palisading, and of course, numerous mitoses and even necrosis may be present within the tumor. So when you look at a lesion like this, you will see that there is a very uh, well-defined uh, border here, and then these large islands or nests of squamous epithelium um, that have pushed out in a broad pushing infiltrating border. When you look at it again on high higher power, you will see that there is a somewhat more basaloid appearance to some of these cells. But again, a very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio with an absence of um, a keratinization in this particular field. So once you have that diagnosis, which is, is, of course, not a new diagnosis, but when you think about new entities or new considerations, they have always come from somewhere else first. And so if you think about the differential diagnosis here with sinonasal papilloma with malignant transformation, sinonasal undifferentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, solid variant of adenoid cystic, but then the smart v one deficient carcinoma category, the nut carcinoma, and the HPV-related multi-phenotypic sinonasal carcinoma are other entities that now come in to the differential as they have been newly described and, in fact, have been separated out from these particular categories as provisional entities. So let's talk about the first one of these provisional entities. And the reason why we use the term provisional is interestingly, to be incorporated into the World Health Organization classification, you need to have had at least two or three publications on a particular topic and have had multiple different institutions involved. So you can't just have um, a single author group um, putting out four or five papers on a single entity without it being corroborated by others. And so at the time that this particular entity was being considered back in 2015 and 2016, unfortunately, the volume of literature on it was not yet sufficient to be uh, categorized as a separate lesion. So it's a distinctive HPV-associated um, carcinoma of the sinonasal tract, and in essence, it has both a surface epithelial derivation as well as showing a salivary gland-type carcinoma pattern with um, a high-grade adenoid cystic carcinoma being the most frequently identified. So it's a bit more common in women than men, a fairly broad age range at initial presentation, but usually in the middle decades of life. Highly cellular proliferation, um, solid nests, frequently with cribriform structures, uh, nice collagenized fibrous connective tissue stroma separating out between it with these basaloid cells that around, uh, line around uh, cylindromatous microcystic spaces, as you would expect in an adenoid cystic pattern. And then angulated nuclei, high NC ratio, true ductal structures are often seen. And then the surface um, dysplasia is usually present in these tumors. In fact, many times if there is ulceration or erosion, um, you may not have uh, evidence of the surface dysplasia, but I think in other um, events, you are more likely to be able to see it. So what is curious is, of course, in this particular case, there is an association with HPV, and certainly the high-risk HPV is the one that is most frequently identified, um, and Cerevar 33 specifically. So it is not the usual 16, 18 that one sees. However, still, because P16 is being turned on by the same location within the HPV um, uh, E6 or E7, you're still going to have strong P16 immunoreactivity. Of course, CD117 and smooth muscle actin S100 will also be positive because there is still an adenoid cystic carcinoma-like pattern. So here is an example of um, a tumor like this. You can tell that there is um, a very uh, well-developed um, surface epithelium up here, but also a well-developed surface epithelium um, on this alternate side where you can see that it actually is expanding into and involving the adjacent um, tumor where you can tell even at this power an adenoid cystic-like carcinoma pattern is easily identified.
If you go up to higher magnification, I think all of you can tell that the surface epithelium here is strongly um, altered with a dysplastic um, squamous uh, appearance. And then that actually blends into the surrounding stroma and then blends again into the area of the adenoid cystic-like pattern. In fact, when you go to other areas of the tumor, it is very easy to see that you truly are dealing with just an adenoid cystic-like carcinoma pattern. So um, very, very well developed in this particular case where you can see that there are nice punched out areas um, that have a, a very um, well-developed adenoid cystic appearance. And then if you go to um, uh, the in situ hybridization, high risk HPV is present, and this, of course, representing um, a broad spectrum, but would, of course, include the Cerevar 33. And uh, this was given to me by my buddy Justin Bishop um, as a very nice example of the in situ hybridization. So let's um, flip for another moment and go to um, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. And again, in this particular case, when you think about sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, um, this particular tumor type um, is a fairly uncommon tumor, only about three to 5% of them, because it's really, in essence, a diagnosis of exclusion. You have excluded the presence of glandular differentiation and you've excluded the presence of um, squamous differentiation. So really, um, this tumor as a category um, is one that that um, is actually shrinking with each and every passing decade. Um, as people look at this particular tumor, they realize that um, they may in fact fit into other categories, which I'm obviously gonna talk about two of them here in a couple moments. So again, you'll notice um, those middle decades of life, again, a strong male predilection. So both the sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma as well as poorly differentiated non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma usually occur in that particular demographic. So when you think about sinonasal undifferentiated, it's usually sheets and lobules. Um, moderately cellular, large cells with a variable amount of cytoplasm. Um, often they do have some well-defined cell borders and it tends to be limited in its pleomorphism, but all of the cells look very monotonous one to another. Very, very high NC ratio, um, uh, hyperchromatic uh, to vesicular, open nuclear chromatin, and usually a very prominent nucleolus. In fact, one of the things that I like to think about is this tumor looks very similar to what you see in a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, so even though you're in a different different anatomic site, it does have a morphologic similarity. And so you do need to know where the sample is being taken from in order to make an accurate interpretation. So of course, you know, apoptosis and necrosis and mitotic figures are also going to be seen. And again, by definition, no squamous or glandular differentiation can be seen in the tumor. I will say though, on some rare occasions, I do see evidence of either a dysplasia or squamous cell carcinoma involving um, the surface. So here is an example of such a lesion. You can see that um, there is a um, intact respiratory epithelium overlying it here in the upper corner. And then here you have these lobules and nests of cells. Um, Pretty well defined. I think you can see that there is a separation between each of them, but a very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio and vesicular open nuclear chromatin. Uh, prominent lymphovascular invasion is a very frequent finding in this particular tumor as well, as you can see from this illustration. And then, of course, when you go to high power, they really do have a very, very um, open nuclear chromatin distribution, very prominent nucleoli, um, and of course, mitotic activity will be seen in several of these tumors as well. So, sort of by definition, you are going to have areas that have a very strong um, CK pan as well as CK7. CK7 being frequently identified in tumors of the head and neck space. Um, but interestingly, again, because it's not a squamous cell carcinoma variant, in this particular case, you're going to see that the CK56 and the P40 are both negative in this particular case. Now, you can see that they are out. Uh, isolated cells along the periphery, and this is in fact still the surface epithelium that has been pulled down and is entrapped by the neoplastic proliferation. But for the most part, the um, documentation of the neoplastic cells being strongly CK56 or P40 positive is usually absent in this tumor. So now when you think about all of the various uh, tumors within the differential for sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, uh, things like lymphoma and non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, as well as neuroendocrine neoplasms need to be considered and certainly are going to have a slightly different immunophenotype as well as overall morphologic appearance. But this is where the SMARC-B1 deficient carcinoma category, as well as nut carcinoma, has now been um, pulled out of as well, because in this particular case, it seems that they are genuine 
Darwin um, entities. So again, with the smart B1 deficient carcinoma category, because of a limited number of publications, it was considered a provisional diagnosis, but still is an entity that should be considered. So um, it is related to inactivation um, of the smart B1, which defines a diverse family of neoplasms. So if you think about it, this really is a large group of tumors that can be seen anywhere else in the body. So when you think about these, they usually have kind of a rhabdoid appearance to them or plasmacytoid appearance. The rhabdoid tumors of the CNS, tum uh, CNS area or perhaps even of the kidney are the ones that you may be the most um, familiar with. So, you know, it's always nice to know what something stands for. And in this particular case, we sniff related matrix associated actin dependent regulator of chromatin subfamily B member one. This is why we do not say that entire name each time we refer to it and just say smart B1. So in this particular case, smart B1 deficient is the um, term that we just use as an abbreviation of that entire long name. So you will notice again, this is in that same age bracket, uh, slightly more common in men, again, because if this is being separated out from tumors that were formerly considered in the sinonasal and differentiated category, you would expect some of the, his the demographic findings to be identical. So in this particular case, um, you will notice that it is in the sinonasal tract, specifically a very biologically aggressive tumor. So this means that um, the patients will frequently have very high um, uh, stage at initial presentation. You can see that 80% of the patients will have a PT4 lesion, regional and distant metastasis develop, and you'll notice that um, nearly two thirds of the patients are dead of disease in less than um, just over a year. So it is a very biologically aggressive tumor in this particular location. So from a pathology perspective, you can actually identify several of these particular uh, tumors where you will see that from a pathology perspective, it's going to have an undifferentiated and basaloid appearance to it. Um, high mitotic rate frequent necrosis is usually seen with these monotonous basaloid type cells present. However, it's when they're rhabdoid and plasmacytoid in a few areas that that can be the tip off to what the underlying diagnosis is, since very often they may have um, prominent nucleoli as well. Um, again, no squamous differentiation in this particular tumor in general without any areas of keratinization. So the definition for this particular tumor is the biallelic inactivation of smart b one or INI1. This is what is identified most frequently. Um, however, I think when you're doing an INI1 immunohistochemistry that reflects this particular inactivation with a loss of nuclear expression, it's a much more meaningful result and very easy to interpret. And of course, you get it back in a very short time. Let me just point out that the the smart b one gene is actually located very near to the Ewing sarcoma. And so when a break apart is done for Ewing sarcoma with the EWSR1, you may actually get a false positive because it will have truncated that particular area as well. And so it's just of caution because of course, Ewing sarcoma is sometimes included in the differential for a smart b one just to realize that you may in fact have a false positive rate. Um, so a false positive reaction. So when you look at this here, you can see, you know, a basaloid appearance to these cells, lots of necrosis present in the center, um, kind of a haphazard distribution, very large um, pleomorphic cells, although they all look similar to one another. So even though they are pleomorphic, they're similarly pleomorphic one to another. Um, another example here where you can see a sheet-like distribution of these cells that have a very high NC ratio, uh, kind of a very blue appearance to them, because of course, again, it is a basaloid morph morphology in this particular tumor. And then here is another example, uh, just very delicate fibrovascular stroma present throughout, uh, giving you um, little islands or nests of these neoplastic cells that have sheeted out in this particular example. Now, when you think about the plasmacytoid appearance, here are some areas of dilapidation, and you will see that there is a very nice area of plasmacytoid differentiation in several of these where there is a separation, almost a rhabdoid appearance to them as they've been pulled off to the side with this plasmacytoid type appearance. So this is actually a very characteristic finding, although again, you can tell I've showed you three or four different images, and yet here is the only time that I'm highlighting it. Again, this is um, given to me by my buddy Justin, and I'm appreciative of that. So here you go to another one where you can see very high NC ratio, a kind of an open nuclear chromatin. In this case, there are even some globules in the background. And again, mitotic figures are usually very easy to identify in this particular tumor. So when you think about the INI, here you can see that there is a very um, strong reaction in the surrounding normal 
um, both uh, inflammatory cells as well as endothelial cells. So in fact, you have constitutive expression of this particular analyte and therefore you have strong internal control when you make the interpretation. So here you will see that the neoplastic cells are completely negative and yet you do have a positive internal control with a nuclear reaction. So I find this to be very, very helpful when I'm interpreting the stains because whenever you use a negative reaction as a positive result, um, I'm always a bit leery about, you know, what's going on, how is it working, um, what's happening in that particular instance. So this is um, an important consideration. Then the next tumor type that was um, incorporated as a new tumor entity. So the other two I've just discussed were provisional. This one is in fact a new tumor entity. So the nut carcinoma, as you know, is a poorly differentiated carcinoma showing abrupt areas of squamous differentiation and is of course defined by the presence of the nut gene rearrangement. As you know, that stands for nuclear protein in testis or NUTM1, nut M1, sometimes abbreviated. So while the vast majority of these particular tumors do develop in the mediastinum and sometimes in the abdominal cavity, um, when they do occur in the upper air digestive tract, the sinonasal tract is in fact the most common location. Now, it's very important for me to point out in this particular instance that the median age at presentation in this particular case you can see is 22 years of age. So um, this means that, um, you know, when is the last time you made a carcinoma, a squamous cell carcinoma diagnosis um, in a 22-year-old? So of course, when you look at it histologically, you kind of think, um, wow, this is a super young age for a person to have a malignancy that's so devastating. And this is when that particular differential consideration should be raised. Now, it does occur in older patients as well, but by far and away, the majority of these are in the less than 30-year age time frame. Slight female predominance for this particular tumor as well. Of course, the etiology isn't really known because it is a translocation-related um, uh, tumor. So this means that the human papilloma virus and EBV virus, other infections, et cetera, are not included. Um, the symptoms tend to be nonspecific, very rapidly growing mass, and you can see that nearly 50% of the patients will have some sort of um, metastatic disease in the lymph nodes of the neck at the time of initial presentation. So it's a poorly differentiated um, carcinoma arranged in this kind of sheet and nested appearance. But what is interesting is they all are very monotonous one to another. So I think in the fusion associated tumors, this monotony of one cell type to another is one of the things that should be used as a tip off to the underlying diagnosis and be able to come up with um, this as a consideration. So it's not wildly pleomorphic in this particular case. They all look very similar one to another. So, um, scanned cytoplasm may be cleared out. Uh, nuclear chromatin is vesicular and open with distinct nucleoli. And again, you can see that description is very similar to what I just said for sinonasal and differentiated carcinoma because this is where the majority of these particular tumors um, have been pulled from. Usually, um, brisk mitotic activity with tumor necrosis present in several cases. The most helpful finding for me, though, are the areas of abrupt keratinization or keratin pearl formation, some sort of squamous differentiation. Um, I think that in most cases, um, these little islands should be identified fairly deep in the biopsy because, of course, when they're occurring on the surface, then there's a sort of question of well, is the surface epithelial pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia that may have invaginated in versus actually being part of the neoplastic proliferation. So um, it's not just, you know, slam dunk, oh, I see abrupt keratinization, it must fit in this. The abrupt keratinization does need to be um, fairly deep in the tumor just so you have um, a correct interpretation. You can sometimes see areas of intratumoral acute inflammation. And of course, glandular and mesenchymal differentiation is a very infrequent finding, but, you know, there are isolated cases that will have that particular finding. So if you think about this, here is a sheet of neoplastic cells, right? They're all very monotonous. They're kind of the small blue round cell morphology, um, very well developed in this particular case, and um, a sheet-like architecture. However, as you look at this central area, you can see that there is this focus of abrupt keratinization way away from any surface um, epithelium. So you can really tell that in this particular case, it probably is reacting to this particular, um, it is part of the tumor rather than necessarily being derived from the surface. An area like this um, just raises part of the other differential considerations. This is a fibrous connective tissue stroma, but you know, it looks a little bit maybe like um, uh, osteoid or neoplastic bone, right? So a small cell um, osteosarcoma often is raised in the differential and certainly in a patient age demographic of the early 20s or even younger, um, it's not uncommon that that particular tumor would be in the differential as well. So it is again something where 
when you look at it on high power, the monotony and some of the background material can be quite deceiving. Sometimes you may even have an acute inflammatory response. And I will say there have been several cases where the acute inflammatory response is so overwhelming that the actual neoplastic proliferation, which are each of these cells here in the background, may in fact be lost. And therefore, someone may not see the neoplasm for all of the acute inflammation and just think that it's part of an acute or um, active chronic rhinosinusitis. So just remember that sometimes acute inflammation may be a component in this particular tumor as well. So again, one final slide just to show the nuclear detail where you can tell that there is a very open vesicular nuclear chromatin, very, very small and prominent nucleoli that are quite easy to identify in this tumor. And again, a very nice area of abrupt squamous differentiation present here in the lower corner. So when you think about your immunophenotypic expression for this particular tumor, um, it is a, an unequivocal diagnosis when you have more than 50% of the nuclei staining with a nut monoclonal antibody. So this is a commercially available antibody, and um, it is something that is um, easy to obtain, although not every lab does it around the nation. So it's a little bit of a challenge to find out which one does it um, as an antibody. So you'll notice, of course, because it is a squamous cell carcinoma, by definition, um, P63, P40, and some of the other cytokeratins would be positive in this particular case as well. And interestingly, CD34 has been identified in several of these tumors as well, um, about 55% or so. So before the nut um, immunohistochemistry was available, in fact, the CD34 was a, the tip off to the underlying diagnosis because you would see the CD34 immunoreactivity in this otherwise primitive appearing tumor and go, hmm, maybe this is an example um, of nut carcinoma. Now, by definition, as you know, the um, NUT1 fuses either with BRD4, which is the most commonly uh, identified partner, although BRD3 is seen in about 6% of cases. And then there's several other genes that will create a chimeric fusion with the NUT um, protein as well. So just be aware that um, the NUT antibody is going to detect any one of these particular fusions and isn't specific for what the partner is. However, if the patient is going to be enrolled into a clinical trial, um, frequently in that circumstance, um, RT-PCR will need to be done in order to be able to identify the exact specific fusion so that the appropriate um, therapy can be instituted for these particular patients. So here you will notice it's a very, very strong um, antibody reaction. One of the hints to the nice reactivity that you see with this is that it is kind of a speckled or stippled immunoreactivity pattern. When I look at each of these areas, you can see that there is stippling to the um, deposition of the um, antibody. So it's a very, very nice finding. And of course, you do have negative endothelial cells to know that there is a true reaction just in the neoplastic cells. Um, just highlighting that it is a squamous cell carcinoma pattern, and so any of a variety of squamous markers would be positive in this particular case, such as you can see with P63 illustrated here, or CK56, P40, you know, whatever are the other squamous markers that you would employ um, in that particular setting. So as you know, it's a, a fusion, so NUT-M1 fuses with the BRD4 and creates a fusion partner, and of course this can be detected with a fish break-apart probe, as you can see illustrated very nicely over here. Now I'm going to try and show um, a video, I don't know if it's going to work, so um, let us pray that it is, and let me illustrate it here. So this is taken from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and this is a jellyfish with neon that is a fluorescence um, product that can be seen uh, when you look at it. And I'm going to play it again just in case that didn't come through well. Um, so ironically, that particular gene was taken from the uh, animal cloned, and this is now utilized in fish. And so ironically, a jellyfish has given us what you actually see in a true uh, fish. So I think that that is um, super nifty. Next tumor category um, is the non-intestinal type adenocarcinoma group, and the new category in this particular case is the renal cell-like adenocarcinoma. Um, this is a tumor that is composed um, primarily of clear cells and looks morphologically basically indistinguishable from a renal cell carcinoma. Um, very, very small cuboidal cells, monotonous, cleared cytoplasm, lacking mucin, very rich in uh, glycogen, and there may be slight eosinophilic appearance to it, but it tends not to have any area areas of perineural lymphovascular invasion, and uh, necrosis and pleomorphism tend to be absent. 
What is helpful here is, as you would expect for a renal cell like carcinoma, um, CA9 and CD10 are both positive in this particular tumor, but you will notice in this case that PAX8 and RCC are in fact um, negative. So that is a helpful finding to say that you are not actually dealing with a metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So here is an example of such a tumor. You will notice that it has um, papillary projections into the luminal spaces, very nice fibrous connective tissue in the background, and of course, these um, small cuboidal cells with cleared out cytoplasm, very easy to see on even this low power. However, when you go up to high power, you'll see that there are even well-developed cell borders. It looks very similar to a renal cell carcinoma, and hence using that particular name of renal cell-like. What is curious, however, is it has this very nice intranuclear vacuoles. Um, they're not really genuine inclusions per se, but they are these little vacuolizations that develop in the nuclei. And whenever I see those particular vacuolizations, um, I find them to be helpful in coming up with the correct interpretation in this particular case. So, as I just mentioned, the CA9 is strongly and diffusely positive in this tumor, while the PAX8 is negative, the two stains that can be used to help you confirm that it is, in fact, a primary tumor in this particular location, rather than representing a metastatic tumor from the kidney. So, um, just covering another couple entities that, you know, have changed, sinonasal papilloma. So, if you think about it, um, Dr. Conrad Victor Schneider was a German anatomist working at the Wittenberg University, and in 1660, published about the fact that the nasal mucosal membrane was the source of all of nasal secretions, rather than the pituitary, which was the guiding light at that particular time. So, after 400 years, there are no longer any eponyms at all in the book. And so, without eponyms, Schneiderian papilloma is out, and they are now all called sinonasal papillomas. Listen, if you've had a run of 400 years, you've done pretty well. I only have had three editions of some of my books, and that definitely um, is not anywhere near 400 years. So, um, it's fun to know that he certainly influenced medicine, and of course, it is still arising from the Schneiderian membrane, but we just no longer have eponyms used in the book. So there has been no change in any of the criteria for sinonasal papilloma, whether they are inverted, onchocytic, or exophytic. So just be aware that one should no longer use the um, eponymic phenomenon or name of a person in the name. So one of the new entities in the book is biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. Um, this is a low-grade spindle cell sarcoma that has you know, a very distinctive histologic as well as immunophenotypic um, criteria, and then these very characteristic molecular features as well. So, you know, whenever you come up with um, a new name for an entity, you always have to say, you know, so where is it that it came from? Well, in this particular case, if you go and look at fibrosarcomas, lyomyosarcomas, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, syn synovial sarcoma, and even the benign or malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors with rhabdomyoblastic differentiation or formerly called triton tumor, these particular lesions definitely do um, house by phenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. The vast majority are probably from fibrosarcoma as an entity, but um, just when you go back and look at things in your files that may have been called any of these other differentials, you will probably find that a biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma is lurking within them. So, you know, the original name for this was low-grade sinonasal sarcoma with neural and myogenic features. Um, a bit of a mouthful, biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma is much easier to say, but um, I think that previous name also, however, generated the specific nomenclature that it was associated with both neural and myogenic features um, from an immunophenotypic perspective. So when you think about this tumor as well, again, more common in females, mean age at initial presentation is in the uh, fifth uh, to sixth decade, tends to involve multiple sites, um, the superior aspect of the nasal cavity and ethmoid sinuses, sometimes expanding into the orbit or even into the cribriform space. So it is a tumor that tends to expand out into these adjacent areas. Um, symptoms tend to be fairly nonspecific for anything actually in the sinonasal tract, um, but a mass is usually easily identified, as you can see in this particular case case with a large mass presenting um, in the um, paranasal sinus. So by definition, there is this very nice um, cellular sub-mucosal um, spindle cell proliferation that's very, very haphazard in its overall distribution, unencapsulated and infiltrative, very frequently involving the associated um, bone where you will have true uh, bone remodeling and destruction. 
Um, the spindle cells can be arranged in these very long and interlacing fascicles, sometimes even giving you a herringbone appearance with this very fine and delicate collagen matrix in the background. The nuclei tend to be somewhat uniform and slender, um, often very few mitotic figures. So in other words, when you look around, it's very difficult to be able to find one. Um, even if you do a key 67 labeling index, there's still very few mitotic figures in general. What is the most helpful finding in this particular case is this remarkably striking proliferation of the surface epithelium. And this invaginates down into the underlying stromal component and into the um, spindle cell proliferation and is really very, very characteristic for this particular tumor. So um, squamous and oncocytic metaplasia uh, of this particular epithelium can also be seen. So it isn't always just a respiratory line ciliated epithelium, but um, that is often easy to see somewhere in the background. Of course, a staghorn type hemangiopericytoma like vascular pattern can be seen in several areas as well. And it's curious to notice that true rhabdomyoblastic differentiation can be seen um, in several of these tumors. In fact, in about 10% or so, they will have that particular finding. And when that occurs, it's actually associated with a different fusion partner, such as FOX01 or NCOA A1. And I'll discuss those fusions here in just a moment. So let's look at the histology. So I think that you can see that there is a intact respiratory epithelial lining at the top with well-developed cilia present. And then you will notice this is invaginated down into the underlying um, uh, spindle cell proliferation. And then small islands of this epithelium are entrapped and pulled deeper into the overall proliferation in this particular case as well. Another example here where you can see that the bone is being destroyed by the neoplasm. It is pulled into this space and destroying the bone as a spindle cell proliferation. But look how this very beautifully respiratory epithelial ciliated epithelium is present um, immediately adjacent to the uh, spindle cell proliferation and of course deep down in the lesion where you have bone invasion. So that epithelial proliferation is from the surface and is not why it is called a biphenotypic um, cyanonasal sarcoma. The biphenotypic nature is related to the immunophenotypic expression, not to the fact that you have an epithelial component, because in fact, this epithelial component is not part of the underlying neoplasm, and molecular studies have proven that it is only the spindle cell component that in fact has the associated fusion. When you look at an area like this, you can tell why um, a previous diagnosis of fibrosarcoma would have been in uh, invoked in this particular case because it's just this very nice fascicular architectural arrangement, very bland appearance to the nuclei. They're elongated and spindled, tapered, um, as you would expect to see in fibrosarcoma. Again, when you see the areas of epithelial islands that are incorporated in within it, that makes it much easier to um, consider this particular diagnosis. So the biphenotypic um, expression is, of course, related to S100, as well as to either smooth muscle actin or muscle-specific actin. And you will notice that I have also included Desmond down here, as well as myogenin. These two tend to be identified a little bit more frequently in in the cases that have rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, but still the smooth muscle actin and muscle specific actin are part of the defining uh, category for the tumor. Now, I think it's very important to highlight that this staining can be very focal. It can be very patchy, and then in other cases, it may be remarkably diffuse. So it's important, especially when you get a very limited biopsy or perhaps a core needle biopsy, only a limited surface biopsy, that if you do the immunophenotypic expression, you may not actually see well-developed smooth muscle actin or S100. And so it's important to at least think about this particular tumor um, and suggest that um, it may be the underlying diagnosis when more of the tumor is being sampled. Um, it is negative for SOX10 and TLE1, STAT6, HMB45 as well, which is helpful with some of the differential diagnostic considerations, especially when one considers um, a spindle cell melanoma or malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, both being positive with SOX10 and TLE1 usually being positive in synovial sarcoma, one of the other tumors considered within the differential. So here is an example of S100. Um, this one is staining, you know, maybe 60 or 70 percent of the nuclei and cytoplasm, um, but it is not a diffuse reaction. You can see several cells that are not positive in this particular field. Um, here is another example of an S100 where you can see that there is much less reactivity, but still many of the neoplastic cells do have a positive nuclear and cytoplasmic reaction. 
Let's contrast that now with smooth muscle, act, smooth muscle actin. Here you can tell, um, you know, there's actually a nice internal control because it's surrounding the area of epithelial invagination. But you can tell that not every one of the neoplastic cells is positive. Another area is surrounding a vessel giving an internal control. But very, very few cells are positive. Whereas in this particular example, you can see that much more of the neoplastic proliferation is positive um, in a much stronger appearance. So again, it's very important to realize that the reactivity pattern for these particular tumors can be quite variable and patchy. Um, beta catenin is expressed in a very strong nuclear and cytoplasmic appearance. Of course, it's only the nuclear expression that is um, a positive reaction in this particular case, but you will see that many of the neoplastic cells, again, are positive. So when you think about the differential diagnostic consideration, that beta catenin is positive in several other tumor types and not just in biphenotypic cyanonasal sarcoma. I'm gonna highlight a couple more in just a few moments. This is just to show that SOX10 is negative. Um, so even though many times people will say, oh, I do S100 and SOX10 because you know they may help and give you nice synergistic reactivity, that is not the case here. So you will see that there is an intact gland, and of course the glandular epithelium is going to be positive for SOX10 as a normal structure, but that the neoplastic cells are completely negative for SOX10. So that can be helpful when you're considering some of the things within the differential diagnosis. So as I've already mentioned, there is a usual associated um, translocation. It's of the PAX3 mammal 3, and that is the one that is the most highly expressed and found in the majority of the tumors. However, when you have um, a rhabdomyosarcomatous differentiation or rhabdoid differentiation within it in isolated areas, it's interesting that those particular tumors then show a PAX3 with either FOXO1 or NCOA A1. And if you remember those two particular genes, you will know that they are the ones that are much more frequently identified within alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. So this is a nice identification of what you're seeing on a histologic basis actually can be matched with what you're seeing um, in the molecular findings as well. Um, recurrences are really quite common in this particular tumor with um, uh, recurrences seen in about 50% of patients. It can be a very delayed recurrence, however, and so these patients do need to be followed from whenever the tumor is identified. Interestingly, there's only been a single case report of a patient um, who has died from disease at this particular point, and so again, it is much more likely to be a local phenomenon and surgical problem than it is to be um, something else. So as you know, it is again um, the PAX3 mammal 3 fusion that is the most frequently identified in this particular tumor. So just let me highlight a few more things. Um, this is not necessarily newly included in the book, but certainly entities that were previously included, but new additional information is now out. So for cyanonasal glomandropericytoma, this is a tumor that shows both perivascular and myoid phenotype uh, arising from the myopericyte, um, peak incidence in the seventh decades. And you will notice in this particular case, again, a strong nuclear beta catenin expression. Interestingly, in this particular case, however, that is highlighted by the fact that there is a single nucleotide substitution um, of the CTNNB1 gene that is, of course, encoding for beta catenin, and therefore with activation, you get um, translocation into the nucleus and therefore nuclear expression of um, beta catenin. So when you think about the histology of this particular tumor, it's an intact surface epithelium in the area of separation, sometimes referred to as a Grenz zone of separation. And then this um, very uh, monotonous proliferation in the background, non descript, it is a patternless arrangement to it. There isn't really usually a very well described um, pattern. And yet you will see very, very vascular with these large patchless and open vessels, sometimes referred to as staghorn type vessels. A periceliomatous reaction of fibrous connective tissue around the vessels is probably one of the most helpful features in this particular tumor. And in fact, on low power is something that I look for in order to be able to help me confirm the diagnosis. I think you can see that there are several eosinophils and mast cells present here in the background. Um, extravasated erythrocytes are also seen, and this is a fairly common finding in this particular tumor, as you can see here on even higher power, where the nondescript nuclei are present in the background. A syncytium of the cells, you can't really tell where one cell starts and where another one begins, but again, lots of eosinophils in the background, and also several mast cells are noticed in the background as well. 
Um, the smooth muscle actin is strongly and diffusely positive in this particular tumor. Again, going with that myoid phenotype, in fact, you have a nice internal control with the vessel here. But this is just to highlight the very strong nuclear beta-catenin that is again seen in this particular tumor um, as a very strong reaction. In this case, um, highlighting the fact that there is, in fact, a CTNNB1 uh, mutation. Solitary fibrous tumor has also come a long way. Um, this is now defined by a specific um, NAB2 STAT6 uh, fusion. Um, so far, it seems like this is something that is fairly unique in this particular tumor, and it doesn't matter where it is occurring within the body. So if you have it in the um, uh, pulmonary area or in the pleura, if you have it in the um, retroperitoneum or wherever it may develop, um, the same histologic findings are usually seen in that particular case. So with this as a um, gene fusion associated tumor, it still has the exact same pathology as it used to, submucosal, um, pseudo-encapsulated, cellular, bland spindle cells, haphazard architecture with this very nice collagenized background stroma. In fact, the collagenized stroma is the tip off to the diagnosis. So we used to use um, CD34, BCL2, and even CD99, any one of those markers being positive in this particular tumor. But I do think now with STAT6 being available as a very strong nuclear reaction, this is something that will help you. And just, you know, for your information, when you order it, make sure that they don't think that you want the stain stat, that it is actually stat six. I know that just sounds very hokey and funny, but the first time I ordered that, they asked me which stain I wanted stat. So um, needless to say, uh, you do have to work with your lab a little bit. So here you can see it's a very nice um, uh, haphazard distribution of the spindle cells set within a very well-developed collagenized stroma, very, very heavy collagen deposition in this particular case. In fact, um, one of the easiest ways to tell this type of collagen is I will drop my sub substage condenser. And when I do that, there is in fact this very, very uh, birefringent or refractile area that you see in this particular lesion. And that birefringent or refractility is actually a very helpful finding uh, when I look at that particular uh, tumor. Um, STAT6, strong and diffuse, it is not a subtle finding. It's very, very easy to identify. Um, every one of the neoplastic cells is positive. And, you know, that is often the case with these things that are fusion-driven. Uh, uh, you really do have a very, very uh, well-developed reaction in all of the neoplastic cells. So I, I think it's a very nice um, stain and very helpful for the overall diagnosis. I'm going to end with sinonasal chondromazenchymal hamartoma. So you may say, wait, isn't this the WHO tumor identification book? And so, you know, this is also included, even though it's called a hamartoma, and there were several hamartomas um, that are included in it, um, including the respiratory epithelial adenomatoid hamartoma and um, chondroosseous respiratory epithelial adenomatoid hamartoma. And the reason for this is they're tumor factors, right? This means that they're actually giving you a mass-like lesion presentation clinically, and that's the reason why the patients um, need to be um, evaluated or followed. So in this particular case, um, it is a locally destructive um, lesion, tumor-like in its pattern, and just having all sorts of mixture of mesenchymal elements, although clearly um, the cartilage is one that is one of the dominant findings. The most frequent clinical presentation is in the newborn to infant age, so less than two years of age, and that is by far and away where you see the majority of these lesions. Quite frequently, um, bilateral lesions will be present. Um, so it has these very, very well-developed um, nodules to less well-developed and vague nodules that vary in size and shape with um, immature to mature cartilage spectrum. These blend with a loose spindle cell stroma in the background. Sometimes uh, the transitions are abrupt and sometimes they less so. Um, the thing that is most interesting uh, is the presence of Dicer syndrome. So as you know, Dicer is an inherited uh, tumor susceptibility syndrome, and this is associated with a wide variety of different tumors as well as hamartomas. Uh, by far and away, the vast majority of these are in lung lesions, uh, pulmonary blastoma, kidneys, ovary, thyroid, sinonasal tract, etc. What is interesting, however, is if you look at um, uh, patients with pulmonary blastoma, and they did a study Study of 600 patients, only four of those 600 patients actually had a sinonasal chondromazenchymal hamartoma. So this says to me that probably the low penetrance here is what is resulting in that particular um, setting. So um, 
here is a cyanonasal polyp, right? If you look at that and you'll say, hmm, I don't see too much there. Well, you know, if you highlight this particular space, you can see that there is a slight aggregation along this entire area that seems to be hmm, slightly more cellular than what you see for the rest of the stroma. So it's a subtle finding. An area like this, again, this entire space here is actually an increased amount of cellularity and all of this is in fact primitive cartilage. So this entire area here is all the primitive cartilage set within the stromal background. And then here, um, perhaps the cartilage is much easier to see because it's kind of in a plate-like distribution in this case, where you can see a nice plate of immature cartilage, although it is uh, heading towards maturity in comparison to what you see in the underlying stroma. In fact, this looks uh, very similar to me to what I see with pseudodecidualization in the endometrium. So sometimes when I see that particular finding here, this is at least a lesion that I think about and consider um, as a possible uh, diagnosis. So um, if you now, in summary, look at just this particular chapter, you will notice that there has been a major effort to consolidate the number of entities and tumor types that are in prison. And there is a remarkable uh, use of ancillary techniques, which in fact was not included um, in the previous editions of books to the same degree as it was now. Many of the tumors had, you know, a nice refinement. Um, there was a major attempt in the entire book to remove from any of the names things that in incorporated grade or age or site. So um, there are still some exceptions. I mean, if you look at Warthen tumor, it's still called Warthen tumor. So I guess um, he's still given some credence, even though Schneider lost his. So um, it, nonetheless, there, there was a major movement to try and remove that. And then, of course, the use of similar terminology across the entire body so that you're now able to have the entire World Health Organization classification used by the entire world, as you can see from this example of a um, neuroendocrine carcinoma of the sinonasal tract. I would like to end um, with a um, shout out in this particular case for a head and neck pathology journal. Of course, as you know, uh, this is the journal that we utilize for head and neck pathology um, exclusively. Um, it is uh, present on Facebook. Uh, it is obviously also present on Twitter. And of course, the Twitter handle is um, head and neck pathol, which is the abbreviation for the journal when you look at it on PubMed. And so with that, I I will attempt to um, answer some questions if there are any. Um, and I'll just go to the very first one that I can see at this point with someone asking, uh, do solitary fibrous tumors favor a particular site? So in the sinonasal tract, no, they do not. Um, they can develop in any of the sinuses or nasal cavity, but of course, by definition, probably the single most frequent site um, for this particular lesion is of course in the pleura. So at least I was able to see that particular question. And at this point, I don't think I see any other questions, although I do see a boatload of hellos and likeits, which is great. And they're coming in from all over the globe, um, including from Syria and Azerbaijan and so forth. So this is awesome. Algeria, it's really fabulous to see even people from Malaysia. So that's wonderful. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson, for tackling this challenging topic and providing us with a great WHO update on the Sinoasal track. I do have another, <clears throat> we have one question from uh, our YouTube audience. It's from Frito Gruel. He's watching from Germany. And he just wanted to know if you could go over the risk factors for biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. So there are not really any um, specific risk factors for the development of the disease. I mean, um, unfortunately, if there was something that we knew caused it, then you could certainly be able to address that. Um, if you look at the older literature for fibrosarcoma, of course, um, radiation exposure was considered to be one of the etiologic factors. That has not been as well developed within the patients who have um, biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. So at this particular point, there is not really any specific uh, risk factor for its cause. If you want to flip on the other side and go to um, prognosis, of course, uh, there isn't really anything specifically like tumor size or tumor location or mitotic activity that would necessarily predict those that are more likely to have 
uh, tumor uh, recurrence. But because it's difficult to eradicate when you think about the nooks and crannies of the sinonasal tract and all of the spaces there, it's often very difficult to remove all of the tumor. Uh, many times nowadays, people are doing robotic surgery or they are doing endoscopically uh, guided surgery. And so with the endoscopic surgery, rather than uh, a true open resection, uh, there may be a slighter, slightly greater chance of having uh, residual disease. Perfect. There's another question on Facebook. I'm, I don't know if you can see it or not, but someone asked for a uh, differentiation between lymphoma and 40 differentiated uh, cytomates. Yeah. So um, in general, I'll tell you the thing that is the most difficult with the lymphomas. And in the sinonasal tract, NKT cell lymphoma is much more frequently identified, whereas in the nasopharynx or in the um, paranasal sinuses, the B cell lymphomas tend to be seen more frequently. So there is a specific tumor type that you're more likely to see in the central sinonasal tract area. And in that central sinonasal tract area, it is always remarkable to me uh, how much pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia can be seen with an NKT cell lymphoma. And so when I look at NKT cell lymphoma and all of the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, the concept of is this a nut carcinoma is definitely raised in that particular setting. However, if you apply immunophenotypic expression and you can do just you know a regular CK pan and an LCA or perhaps even doing a CD3 um, or one of the other markers, uh, even EBV if you prefer, because they are usually positive for uh, the NKT cell lymphoma category, um, uh, those will definitely be strongly positive and help you to make that particular separation. Um, you know, I don't tend to do um, hundreds of immunohistochemistry studies initially. Um, I tend to have a bit more focused approach with doing a pan cytokeratin an S100, a Desmond, an LCA, and perhaps some marker for um, neuroendocrine differentiation like synaptophysin, chromogranin, or CD56, any one of those three. I tend to use synaptophysin more commonly. But um, in that particular case, I do think that um, it is something it is where something you're where able to you're able uh, get to a general packet of location and a general category in which you can put it and then do additional workup at that particular point. So I can see there's a question here from uh, Danny uh, Lubin uh, asking about um, neuroendocrine staining in sinonasal tumors and how much do you allow? So, um, so the sinonasal undifferentiated category by definition should not have neuroendocrine uh, features histologically. So this means that if I have a very fine um, uh, salt and pepper nuclear chromatin distribution, a suggestion that there may be some nuclear molding, uh, something that is histologically indicative to me that there's neuroendocrine differentiation, that is not something I would put into the sinonasal undifferentiated category. So if I do have a tumor though, that as I described here, these open uh, chromatin, very, very prominent nucleoli, and there's synaptophysin or chromogranin or CD56. It's usually patchy, meaning this up to maybe 30, 40% of the tumor cells may show delicate reaction. That's still okay. However, if I have a very strong and prominent dot-like immunoreactivity next to something, then, you know, at least depending on where you are anatomically, you should consider pituitary tumors in the differential as well, because pituitary um, adenomas, especially in the sphenoid sinus, can and have some cytologic atypia and um, present in that particular location. So that's not really in the differential for sinonasal undifferentiated, but um, it, it is something that can certainly occur. So um, another question saying, how often do you see negative P16 in uh, SNUC? Actually, uh, SNUCs can be positive with P16, but it is not by far and away the majority. So um, I don't tend to use P16 um, as a helpful or discriminating marker in this particular case, because there's so many lesions that will be positive for it that do not necessarily represent transcriptionally active HPV. And so I really don't want to like confuse myself or others and saying it's P16 positive and then they're like, oh, is it HPV driven? So, you know, I gave you an example here of a specific HPV related uh, sinonasal carcinoma and um, that is with the adenoid cystic carcinoma like features. But just be aware that, uh, you know, that's a targeted setting. It's not just doing P16 randomly on all of the head and neck uh, related tumors, especially in the sinonasal tract. 
Um, another question here from Amal. Um, how do you differentiate high-grade neuroblastoma from neuroendocrine carcinoma? Um, this is definitely a philosophical question and a good one to raise um, because quite frequently in the high-grade uh, neuroblastoma, um, you tend to have more of a sheet-like distribution with much more in the way of necrosis and high mitotic figures. However, in general, um, neuroblastoma, uh, olfactory neuroblastoma should not have keratin distribution. When it is positive, it's single isolated cells and often with CAM 5.2 or isolated cells with EMA. I don't tend to use that particular diagnosis when I have diffuse keratin reactivity. So if I have diffuse keratin reactivity within the tumor, a neuroendocrine carcinoma is much more likely to be a diagnosis that I would use in this particular case, rather than trying to say it's a high-grade olfactory neuroblastoma. Now, having said that, S100 protein may also be of value because um, no matter what the grade, uh, somewhere within the tumor, you still have the supporting sustentacular framework outlined by the S100 or GFAP. Either one of those two markers can be positive, but they will often can be seen um, in that particular setting and can be a helpful um, separator as well. And um, neuroendocrine carcinomas um, can actually also uh, be more likely to be seen with um, positive neuroendocrine markers. Um, one of them, oh, I can't remember the name now. I think it's um, <laughs> NKX 3.2 or 2.3 or whatever it is. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. Too many numbers in my head at the moment. But um, there can be very specific uh, neuroendocrine markers that may be of value uh, to make that particular separation as well that are present in neuroendocrine carcinoma and not in olfactory neuroblastoma. Um, someone had asked, um, Dr. Aru had asked about a sensitive and specific marker for solitary fibrous tumor. And again, I'd like to point out that definitely STAT6 is that marker. So it's going to be the one that is going to be more likely to be um, positive in that particular case um, and really is not positive in any of the other things um, within the differential. Um, I don't know if I'm seeing all of the questions because I, they are popping up quite frequently and I don't know how far down they are um, before I've missed them. <laughs> so, Emilio, if you want to tell me if I've missed them, go ahead. <laughs> no, I think you fit all of them. I have a question from YouTube, actually. It's just about the terminology cytonaso and mandiparicytoma. Does that still exist or is it just SFT? So um, it does not. Um, as you know, several years ago, in fact, it's probably 2003 or 2004, glomangiopericytoma was the term invoked for the previous sinonasal glomangiopericytoma or sinonasal type uh, hemangiopericytoma. So that particular terminology uh, was removed. And then, of course, solitary fibrous tumor does look very different. I have seen combined solitary fibrous tumor and glomangiopericytoma, meaning uh, both tumor types are present um, and juxtaposed next to each other. And when those have been stained, in fact, they will be positive for STAT6 uh, in the area of solitary fibrous tumor and with uh, nuclear beta catenin in the area of uh, glomangiopericytoma. So they are probably more of a collision tumor. But, you know, the previous terminology of uh, uh, sinonasal hemangiopericytoma or anywhere else in the body, the idea of solitary fibrous tumor, hemangiopericytoma being kind of on a spectrum, I think has now been um, eliminated with the identification um, of the STAT6 reactivity and uh, fusion. Okay. Out of curiosity, what's your uh suggested IHC panel for small round blue cell tumors of the sinonasal tribe? Yes, yeah, so um, what I just mentioned um, a couple of moments ago is definitely how I would um, usually begin. So a CK pan, an S100, um, I usually have a Desmond in that particular location as well. CD45 um, RB and either synaptophysin uh, or chromogranin um, is very helpful uh, in that particular setting. So I usually start off with a panel of those five markers and then will expand from that particular point as necessary. And I guess if you're worried for an adamant, uh, uh, adamantinoma like Ewing, CD99 could be. Yes, yeah, so CD99, 
Yeah, it's positive in so many things, though I don't usually use it in a panel. Um, it depends what happens with that particular marker group initially as to then what I may add on at that particular time. Um, you know, the Ewing's um, is much more sensitively associated with CD99, but I can also tell you that Fly1 and ERG are also positive in those particular tumors, among others. So, um, you know, there, there definitely are alternate markers that can be added on as you uh, begin to move further into a specific category. Um, but just in general, using, you know, kind of a, an initial panel just to make sure that you're not overlooking something. Um, just as an example of that, um, and I didn't, you know, discuss it here because it wasn't a new entity per se, but sinonasal rhabdomyosarcoma, um, up to 50% of those particular tumors, especially the alveolar type, are positive with keratin. So if you just did a CK pan and didn't do the Desmond at the same time, you would see this immunoreactivity and think you're dealing with a carcinoma and maybe add a few more markers uh, to see what's going on with which type of carcinoma and maybe just say, well, it's poorly differentiated carcinoma. And yet this would be a completely wrong diagnosis and therefore the wrong management as well, because many times the chemotherapy and radiation alternatives for rhabdomyosarcoma are very different for um, squamous cell carcinoma. Perfect. All right. So, okay, it does not appear that we have any more questions at the moment. I don't know if you could see any, but I think we've covered most of them or all of them. Uh, Excellent. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure, and um, I'll look forward to popping back online with you in, <laughs> I think, a couple months when we go through the um, non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. Prepare yourself and gird your loins. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. So uh, just remember, you can continue the conversation on Facebook by posting directly to the video once it's archived, and you know, we might have a chance to get to these to some of these questions after the fact. And uh, up next on the 24th of May, Dr. Zubair Paloj will be presenting an algorithmic approach to thyroid FNA live from Philadelphia. And like Dr. Thompson mentioned, he will return on the 30th of July to present an alphabet soup of thyroid neoplasms. As always, today's lecture can be found on pathologycast.com. If you enjoyed the session, please make sure to subscribe to, your, to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook page. Until next time, thank you very much.